Decision for Life. Welcome to First Baptist Church Indian Trail. It is delight to be back. I love your pastor and his precious wife. I'm so grateful to God for their friendship. And only heaven knows how many times I've been blessed by this great church, by its pastor, by its music, and just by you dear people. So thank you for the privilege to be here. Tonight at 6 o'clock, Charles Billingsley will lead us in worship. It'll be sort of a um, one-two punch, kind of involving us in praise and worship and then singing a couple of songs. And then I'll bring a message on who's your one and identify the two people that we're missing biblically uh, that should be our one and that will never turn things around. What, what a great song the choir just sang. When we had realized that the fields are white under harvest, we pray that the Lord would send people into the harvest. And he normally sends those that are praying. Uh, bottom line is there was a day that the overarching theme of Southern Baptist was that we've got to keep the main thing the main thing. Well, I'm here to inform you it is no longer the main thing across America. It is in wonderful churches like this. But tonight we'll be joined by literally dozens and dozens of other churches. Tomorrow morning you'll hear your pastor at 8.30. You'll hear Nick Floyd, Ronnie Floyd's son. You'll hear a young lady that's one of the greatest soul winners on our team that will speak. So you women, I hope you'll please come. And then Jimmy Scroggins was to be with us. He has the flu. He says it's not the coronavirus. Thank the Lord. And so I will fill in his slot. So we just heard. I want to speak to you today on the opposite of revenge. And so Matthew chapter 18, verse 21, it's a passage you know, but I pray that God will give us greater insight into it. Beginning with verse number 21. Then Peter came to him and said, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Up to seven times, and by the way, we, we do the same thing. We basically say, I'll tell you one thing, they have, they have offended me one time too many. I am through with them. And yet it's Jesus that teaches us the principle of forgiveness. And you, you can't even understand the gospel if you don't understand forgiveness. And so he says, up to seven times. And Jesus said, I do not say to you up to seven times, but 70 times seven. So not seven times, but 490 times. Here's one thing for sure. If you ever forgive somebody 490 times, you will be in the habit of forgiving. I've often thought, have I ever been forgiven or asked forgiveness from any person 490 times? And two come to mind. Uh, the Lord Jesus and my wife. All right, and so uh, in both have forgiven me. So Janet, for 50 years, this coming November, oh my, I don't know how many times. The Bible says, therefore, the kingdom of heaven is like unto a certain king who wanted to settle accounts with his servant. And when he began to settle accounts, one was brought to him who owed him 10,000 talents. But as he was not able to pay, his masters commanded that he be sold and his wife and his children and all that he had and that payment be made. The servant, therefore, fell down before him saying, Master, have patience with me, and I will pay you all. Then the master of that servant was moved with compassion, released him, and forgave him the debt. But that servant went out and found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii. And this is the, the context of the gospel. This man owed the master 10,000 talent. But the person that owed him owed him a hundred denarii. And he laid hands on him, took him by the throat, saying, pay me what you owe. So the fellow servant fell down at his feet and begged him, saying, have patience with me and I will forgive you all. And he would not, but went and threw him in prison till he would pay the debt. So when the fellow servant saw what he had done, and by the way, we are being observed. Uh, by the way, we respond when we're injured by others. Matter of fact, I believe that when I'm injured during the week, word gets out in the Woodstock community and they're listening on Sunday. If somewhere, I'm going to insert a statement to stab the individual. 
that did me harm. So it's victory when you can leave it at the cross. And the Bible said that the servant saw what was done and look what they did. They were grieved and they came and told their master all that had been done. And that's what we do when we see two people in the church not getting along. We may confront them, but we're also going to pray that God move them before we try to move them. Then his master, master after he had called him, said to him, and listen what he called him. This is what the Lord calls one of his children when they're not willing to forgive someone. You wicked servant. Wow, that's pretty powerful. And by the way, a lot of times people talk about a pastor being harsh. The only people that think a pastor is harsh is one that's never read what Jesus preached. That was a good place to say amen, but I'll, I'll remind you, it's a new time. I forgave you all the debt because you begged me. Listen to this. Should you not also have compassion on your fellow servant just as I had pity on you? And his master was angry, delivered him over to the tormentors, that is spiritual discipline, until he should pay all that was due him. So my heavenly father also will do to you, each of you, if you from your heart do not forgive his brother his trespass. Father, speak to us in Jesus' name. Amen. The opposite of revenge. Most people dealing with unforgiveness base their grudge or offense on what someone did or said to them or what you did. So let me just give two clarifying statements, one on forgiveness and one on unforgiveness. Forgiveness is the act of setting someone free from an obligation to you that is a result of wrong done against you. All of us at one time or another have been forgiven or have granted forgiveness. I've owed and I've been owed. However, there's a temptation to bear injury in your life and as a result hold a grudge, allow bitterness to set in and become unforgiving. And by the way, let me tell you that it will lead you to a spirit of cynicism. I lead some of the largest senior adult conferences in the country. On the other hand, I lead some of the largest student conferences in the country. Same message. And oftentimes someone will come to have a book signed and he may say something like this. Hey, while you're signing that book, I'd appreciate it if you'd make a note to pray for me. My grandkids won't come and visit me. And after I talk to him for about three minutes, I think I wouldn't come visit you either. <laughs> He's become cynical. Uh, cynicism sets in when you start pushing back against the gospel. And by the way, please hear me. It, it'll come with greater clarity as I preach. Forgiveness is really giving clarity to what the gospel is all about. Well, that's forgiveness. How about unforgiveness? It's a bondage that stifles our ability to love and accept those that we know in our hearts most deserve our love. It's a bondage that chokes out the abundant life that Christ promised to those who believe. So to understand what God in Christ did for us and then to refuse to forgive those who have wronged us is like the wicked, ungrateful slave in the context. Charles Stanley said forgiveness involves three elements. Number one, injury, what was done or said to you. Number two, a debt resulting from the injury, this attitude. He or she will pay for this. And then forgiveness is the cancellation of the debt. I I'm willing to choose to do what is right and I'm going to forgive them. When we refuse to forgive others, there's a sense in which we attempt to hold them hostage. So when a person is taken hostage on an international scene, the abductors normally want something in return. It may be money, weapons, or release or prisoners. Their message is, if you give us what we want, we will give you back what we have taken. There's always some sort of condition, a ransom of some sort. So when we refuse to forgive others for a wrong done, by them, we're saying the same thing. But instead of holding people hostage until we get our demands, we withhold love, acceptance, respect, service, kindness, and patience. Sometimes someone says, you know, somebody did me wrong, but I, I honored Jesus, I forgave them. 
And then you were at the grocery store Thursday and you turned your buggy to go down an aisle and saw them and changed aisles. <laughs> There's a contrast in words in verses 21 through 35. Listen to the contrast. On one hand, there's anger. On the other hand, there's compassion. On one hand, there's prison. On the other hand, there's release. On one hand, there's choking. On the other hand, there's forgiveness. So forgiveness reflects the highest human virtue because it so clearly reflects the character of God. So a person who forgives is a person who emulates godly character. You can be known for your godliness because of your capacity to forgive. So let me deal with three things, deal with it briefly, keep us right on time. First of all, let me deal with what I call the depth of forgiveness in verses 21 and 22. Now Peter's trying to calculate things that don't seem, listen to this, that don't seem to add up. Hey, Lord, how many times should I forgive uh, someone? Uh, seven times? And so how many times do I need to forgive someone before I can make them pay me what they owe? So Jesus has a different idea, this is good, of the value of forgiveness. Jesus is about to teach Peter that he needs more than a calculator. He needs a change of thinking in his understanding of God's love and forgiveness. Now, why would he say seven times? A Jewish tradition taught that we have to forgive three times. So Peter doubles the number and added one for a good measure. How about seven? And then verse 22 speaks of an immeasurable an unlimited term of grace, 70 times 7, 490 times. So when we think of the depth of God's forgiveness, here it is, we can't touch bottom. That's the depth of forgiveness. But how about the description? Does he describe it? Nobody told stories as good as Jesus. Jesus loved to tell a story. And so in trying to help Simon Peter and others to understand the depth of forgiveness, he begins to describe it. And he does it by talking about the kingdom of heaven, like life in the kingdom. Or listen carefully. If Jesus Christ is the resident king in my life, this is what the kingdom life looks like. So the question is, do I want a kingdom life? Do I want to live in such a way that Jesus Christ it's ruling and reigning in my life. And so he starts by saying, uh, somebody owed the master 10,000 talents. Well, let's understand this if you want to understand what the Bible describes about forgiveness. In the economy of that day, a man would have to work, this is good, 20 years to earn one talent. Do the math, 20 years. Nobody could earn 10,000 talents. If it takes 20 years to earn one and you owe 10,000, what is he doing? He's trying to get each of us that claim we're part of God's kingdom to realize that we, we owed a debt. We were all incapable of paying. So you'll never understand the gospel until you understand forgiveness. So when I think about my offense against God, where I sinned against God, I owe 10,000 talents. Let me tell you where we get in trouble. We try to compare the debt we owed God to that measly amount that somebody owes us. Oh, you just don't know what they did against me. No, you've got it wrong, sir. You don't understand what you did against God. And you never will understand properly how to evaluate an offense until you know who your offense was against. So in terms of buying power, it was probably equivalent even in that day to $10 million. You say, well, well that, that doesn't seem like we can't get our mind around it. Well, hold on just a moment. The talent was the highest known denomination of currency in the ancient Roman Empire. And 10,000 was the highest number for which the Greek language had a particular word. 
So the NIV translates in the margin that the amount was so enormous that it was on the borderline of what the ancient mind could even conceive. Uh, every now and then somebody says to me, good night, uh, so-and-so, did you hear how much money they have? I mean, how much do they have? And, and, and so we don't know what to use. So I don't know what you use, but I say they, they're worth a gazillion. In other words, it, it's incalculable. I, I don't even know how to proceed. So what is Jesus' point? The number of the debt we owed him is so vast, so unaccountable, uh, so countless, so incalculable, an unpayable debt. So what did we do? Someone came up with a little statement and said, uh, we owed a debt we could not pay. And he paid a debt he did not owe. So the unpayable debt represents the debt for sin that every person owes God. I owe a debt I cannot pay. That's really when somebody says, you know, I've never trusted Jesus Christ, my Lord and Savior, but I've done about as good a job as I can, and I believe that one day God's going to let me into the kingdom, and we try to say he's going to let us in because of some good that we've done, and the truth is, here's what he's saying. You owe a debt that is so incalculable, there's no end or heaven that you're ever going to get into the kingdom unless the debt is forgiven living in Atlanta and, and won't bore you with it but some of you know it's an older story that I spent a day with Ted Turner had the chance to present the gospel let his girlfriend JJ Ebom she was this pilot of his personal jet and she also was in charge of new programming I led her to Christ baptized her in Ted's private lake and then I led Ted to seek forgiveness of the Christian community by making two statements, one that would be counterproductive to what you just uh, had the church applauding over. He said that uh, uh, pro-lifers were bozos and that Christianity uh, was just a religion for the weak. And, and then he was drunk when he said that he was receiving an award for it. And so he called my office and wanted to know what he could do to make it right. I'd never met him before in my life. And so we met, I hosted him. And so I just saw that to say this. A few years ago, the Atlanta Journal-Constitution, and you can Google it and find it. Here's what Ted Turner said. I know I'm going to go to heaven. This, this is where America is. I know I'm going to go to heaven. And the reason I'm going to heaven is because of my philanthropy. I have I've have given away so much money. He said, now don't look for me in the better seats. I, here's what he said. I will be in the cheap seats. Make, make it, and by the way, let me just say something. There are no cheap seats because that's cheap grace. And the only way somebody gets there is because of the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. And when a person gets there, it's because God has paid a 10,000 talent debt for them. So, so just give me a little cabin in the corner of glory land. That is foolish. That's your favorite song. Just get over it. So in order to teach what forgiveness looks like in the kingdom of God, and that's what he's doing, Jesus' story will contrast forgiveness from a human standard of evaluation. And that's what's wrong with us. We, who in the heaven wants to have a theology that's based on human speculation when you can have a theology based on divine revelation? What God says, not what humanity thinks. That's why we're in trouble. So here's, here's the issue. We can view our sin as a hundred in there. I, I, hey, do you rise your sinner? L listen to me. Hey, do you rise your sinner? Well, I've not been that bad. You owe 10,000 talent. You, you, you owe more than you have the capacity to ever pay in your lifetime. Helps me to realize just how bankrupt I am. That's why the Beatitudes, oh gosh, so much teaching here. And so, um, and we view, here's what we do. We view our sin against God as a hundred and area, and we view the sin that somebody else committed against us as 10,000 talent. Oh, you just don't even know how they offended me. Well, la di da da So let my thoughts go there, and you miss completely not only the lesson of Matthew 18's parable, but the heart of the gospel. Oh, by the way, this is interesting. What is a hundred denarii? Because, now we got it right? Are we tracking? I mean, I know it's time change. Uh, 10,000 talent, it takes 20 years to earn one. I mean, you owe 10,000. I mean, you can't do it. There's no way you can pay it. Nobody. 
Nothing in my hands I bring. Simply to the cross I cling. But how about a hundred denarii? Uh, that's three months' salary. Let me just tell you what theologians say. In the currency of that day, you could carry three months' salary in your front pocket. C keep that in your mind. So we, what we have had done against us is like three months. What we've done against him is 20 years for every one of the 10,000 offenses. So do we truly grasp the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ, until we see that our sin against the holy God is far greater injustice than anything that could be done to us? Wow. Matthew Henry wrote, if that is the measure of forgiveness the disciple has received, any, oh, this is good, any limitation of forgiveness he shows to his brother is unthinkable. So I must see myself in the shoes of a 10,000 talent, uh, the appreciation of a massive debt forgiven, a sin against the holy God. It forms the basis and starting point of our forgiveness of one another's small hundred denarii offenses. So here's forgiveness fact. Without understanding the depth of our sin against God and the riches of his forgiveness toward us, we'll never be able to forgive others. Hey, is this a statement, just a basic statement? It just seems to me that if I've experienced forgiveness, I would be able to express forgiveness. But wait, wait a minute. Could it be that the reason some people don't express forgiveness it really doesn't tell me about the offense against you. It, it really tells me more about you. Because if you can't express forgiveness, you can't. I, I received a letter when I was being nominated as president of the Southern Baptist Convention from a leading theologian in our Southern Baptist Convention. I'll never forget what it said. He said, you know, I'm probably going to vote for you, but I'm struggling more about you being president than anybody that's run since the conservative research. And I want to tell you why. Johnny, your problem is you love everybody. Adrian Rogers, before he died, told me I would never have to repent of being kind to others. Well, oh, I got a lot going on in my mind right now. So in forgiveness, Jesus paid or absorbed my debt I could not pay. Here's a good way to read it. Colossians 2.14, having wiped out the handwriting of a requirement that was against us, which was contrary to us, and he's taken it out of the way. He's taken my sin and nailed it to the cross. So the Bible teaches, listen to this, when the other fellow, he's been forgiven everything, he falls down and he says, please forgive me. And then the very next few days, somebody comes to him that owes him, and he's got to remember what he just did because this guy does the same thing, falls down before him. He asks for mercy. He's asking for mercy. And what does he do? Throws him in prison. You can, he's a Baptist. I'm telling you. I'll guarantee you. He's a Baptist. Throw him in prison. No, sir. I'll tell you what. I've dogfight forgive him. No, siree. But when the master heard that, he was angry and delivered him over to the tormentors. In other words, God began to deal with him. Let me give you some statements and then one illustration and I'm going to quit. Nothing that we have to forgive can ever faintly or remotely compare with what we've been forgiven. That's the gospel. So if you, you don't understand that, you, 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 you're struggling with the gospel. Say it again. Nothing that we have to forgive can ever faintly or remotely compare to what we've been forgiven. Forgiveness must be given, not earned. I'll forgive them when they deserve it. Boy, I'm glad God didn't say that to me. And listen to this one. I'll tell you what, listen to this. This is a Baptist statement I've ever heard one. I'll tell you what, they sinned against me and Pastor Johnny, I want you to know God knows my heart. I forgave them, but I don't want anything else to do with them. What if Jesus said that to you? Well, here you are again with the same old struggle and I want you to know this morning on change time, I forgive you, but I don't want anything else to do with you. If that resembles the Lord Jesus Christ, we're in, we're in danger. 
we're in trouble. Forgiven sinners can forget. So, so here's, here's forgiveness facts. Forgiveness is a choice. You choose by an act of your will to forgive once and for all. You release the person from debt and you unlock the prison doors with the key. And you thank God for deepening your understanding of the gospel. All right, y'all watch me here. I'm not through. I gotta do something and then I'm done. That's why I brought this in here. Only illustrate because I really wanted to understand this text. So here it is and I'm through. When somebody sins against me, the Bible refers to it as a hundred denarii. Three months salary that you can carry in your pocket. But then when God says, Johnny, the reason you are to forgive others is it's the gospel thing to do. Get a clear understanding of the gospels. Get your focus off who you need to forgive. Get your focus on the gospel and on Jesus. So here's what he says. You owed 10,000 denarii. You owed me a debt you couldn't pay for your sin. If I can carry 100 denarii in my front pocket, what does it take to carry 10,000 talent? You ready? It takes 8,600 soldiers with a backpack, and each backpack weighs 60 pounds. You tracking with me? 8,600 soldiers. 60 pounds in the backpack. Place them three yards apart and they'll stretch five miles. Look, look at me for just a moment. There's not a person in this room that has the capacity to see five miles on flat land. Five of you can see. That's what he's done with your sin. Hold on. As far as the east is from the west, it's early, but somebody ought to get happy. Just, just one ought to get happy. I mean, he has taken your sins as far as the east is from the west. He's nailed them to the cross. And when you get a picture of what he's done for you, you will quit your strutting and justifying and rationalizing and minimizing your unforgiveness toward others and God will flat set you free. There, there's some people that borrowed something from you and never paid you back. How do you know that? Because I'm a generous giver and I have been ripped off more times than you can imagine. And my wife says to me, oh my God, did you loan them money again? Don't you remember? No, I kind of do now that you're reminding me, but I had taken... <laughs> But I'd, I'd taken that, come on now, I'd taken that to the cross and Jesus had nailed it to the cross and he had wiped it out and taken it out of the way. And I want to live gospel-centered. And so since he gave me another chance, Father, in the name of Jesus, thank you for the gospel. Thank you that you forgave me more than I can calculate. Thank you even for this morning showing me that it's pride in my heart to have to read Oswald Chambers three times and the last time on my knees to understand that my pride is not so much that I'm not willing to at times get right with you, but such arrogance that I don't even consider who my offense is against. And so thank you for preparing my heart for that truth. Use this message in our heart today. Heads bowed, eyes closed. Right on time, plenty of time here to do business with the Lord. Gosh, here we are early on Sunday morning, but it could very well be that uh, you're, you're at a point where Alan Taylor just texted me before the service and said, his son has never genuinely followed Jesus but claimed to have known him for over 30 years. And he and Linda knelt with him last night and he turned from his sins and placed his faith in Christ. They're baptizing him in East Tennessee this morning, Concord Baptist Church. And I rejoiced with Alan and with the entire Taylor family. Do you know him? 
Has there really been genuine change in life? Have you experienced the gospel? That, that uh, an incalculable debt has been paid on your behalf? Can you express that type of forgiveness toward others? Or have you become cynical through having it your way? I pray God do what's necessary in my heart and in your heart. Maybe, maybe you're visiting early service and this is the church God have you to be a part of. And, and even that, uh, this church ministers to you. It's a place to belong, a place to support, a place to serve. So I'm sure the doors are open to receive you. And then maybe, I would say most of you are like myself, you know the Lord. The altars are open. And if Jesus has spoken, I mean, if he's been so kind to speak specifically to you, maybe he would call you to a specific decision of uh, making a choice this morning uh, to forgive and allow him to have his way in your heart. Let's stand all over the building. We're standing. And I'm going to invite you as pastor comes to respond in whatever way God may be calling you. The altars are open. Pastor will be here at the front. And I'll ask you to come. Lord, have your way. We love you this morning. And as we've been singing, uh, you're able. You, you really are able. What a tender song to just speak of what you've done for us. And help us to respond in like to you. For Jesus' sake. Amen. Let's sing. And we invite you to come. Thank you for watching Decision for Life. Our location, life group, and program information are available online at fbcit.org. We hope you will take the opportunity to join us in person. Thank you from the family of First Baptist Church Indian Trail.